Hello, welcome back to my channel. Welcome to my annual YouTube upload. Like seriously, I'm probably not going to upload for another year after this one. Anyway, if you didn't already know, during 2017, uh, I've been growing as a music fan in general. And for a few months, I just wanted to talk about my opinions on music with people. So uh, what better way to do that than with a platform like YouTube? Now I may as well say who I've been inspired by before we get into the video. So if you notice any elements of these three YouTubers, then it's probably because I've been watching a lot of them. First of all, there's Anthony Fantano from The Needle Drop. He reviews new album releases on his main channel, and he discusses other topics within the industry on his second channel. Secondly, there's Sean C, who essentially does the same thing as Fantano, but in a little bit more of an informal style. Fantano will review an album in depth after listening to it initially, however Sean C typically gives his live first reaction to an album, and then he follows it up with his final thoughts in a separate video. And finally, there's Dead End Hip Hop, who are just a group of friends who essentially sit and discuss their individual thoughts on an album uh, or topics, different music industry topics, just among themselves. I would 100% recommend all these guys, you know, as if me recommending them is going to give them loads more views because I'm way more popular than they are. Well, let's just start the video already! So as the title suggests, I'm going to share some of my favourite albums of 2017. Uh, and because I've only just got into the album format this year, there's only six albums on the list, but I'll start with number six. Yesterday's Gone. Loyal Connor is a London rapper who has a very distinct style in comparison to a lot of his London contemporaries, with grime music becoming more popular in the UK with the rise of some pretty talented artists such as Skepta, JME, Stormzy, uh, and many others. Uh, these guys usually adopt quite an aggressive approach. However, Loyal Connor follows a route considered more like alternative hip-hop, and it's very confessional, emotional, and introspective in his lyrics. So for each album, I'm going to pick out three of my favourite tracks. Uh, and on this album, my three favourites are, first of all, No CD, which is probably my favourite song from the album. Uh, it strings together three fantastic verses, specifically the third verse, where Loyal Karna's flow is just so smooth. The production switches up throughout the song as well. It's very nice. It's just go listen to it. Secondly, ain't nothing changed. On this song, Loyal Karna seems to be discussing the situation he's been growing up in, uh, how his family has been in debt, his lack of a father, uh, etc. The production's really cool and jazzy. There's like this saxophone throughout most of the song. And third of all, you've got Stars and Shards, where Loyal Karna discusses drug dealing. Uh, the song's just so packed with lyrical talent and he doesn't let up at any point on the track. I also like the choice to use the stripped down more guitar-oriented title track as the album closer. It's, it's, it's like a very mellow moment for an album that explores such personal themes. Layla's Wisdom. Rhapsody definitely solidified her place in the rap game with this album, and is definitely one of the most talented female hip-hop artists right now. She discusses a lot of themes like power, love, self-worth, and there were plenty of features which I personally enjoyed from this one, such as Anderson Pack, Kendrick Lamar, Black Thought from The Roots, and BJ the Chicago Kid. If I had to pick three favourites, they would have to be Black and Ugly, first of all. Rhapsody just sounds immensely confident on this track. She's embracing her blackness instead of disassociating herself with it. She isn't letting others judge her. And that BJ the Chicago Kid feature on the hook is so perfectly placed. He sounds amazing. Ninth Wonder handles the production on the track, which is probably why the beat is incredible. Secondly, Power. Rhapsody and Kendrick both really go off on this track about the power of their rapping prowess, as well as Rhapsody talking about other things that possess power, such as the power of birth, also seemingly the power of sex. And there's this fantastic line in the first verse where Rhapsody mentions how a badge can make a policeman feel powerful. And then Kendrick just comes in later on and delivers one of his best verses yet. He just strings together lines about the power of his rapping ability, the power of his influence. And then halfway through the verse, he just starts rapping with a, a Jamaican patois. And I think it's just, it's just kind of brilliant. Again, Ninth Wonder produced it, which is why the beat is so good. And third, you've got the song Chrome. Uh, the production is mainly what gets me with this song, even though it's not Ninth Wonder this time. Rhapsody does deliver some more fantastic lines, like the one in the first verse. You got a shot, young, and you ain't got to get shot. Brick body kids still daydream. Why am I doing this so close to the camera? I'm going to be completely honest here. Uh, I hadn't heard any of Open Mike Eagle's discography before I listened to this album, and I still haven't, but I'll listen to his other stuff soon. In the meantime, we'll discuss this album. Uh, this is a concept album where Mike takes an introspective look on growing up in the Robert Taylor homes 
which are situated in Chicago. For the most part, the album is very low-key and emotional, and Mike has this like whispered tone and inflection for like the majority of the album, which I think is a very nice touch. Uh, and if I had to pick three favourite songs of this album, they would be, first of all, Happy Wasteland Day. Uh, this is definitely, definitely, definitely one of my favourite songs of 2017. In the hook, Mike is describing the United States as a wasteland, and he also repeats the phrase, this is normal now, inferring that all the turmoil and destruction and horrible events that have taken place in the US over the past year have just become normal. He begins describing his negative opinion on Trump, I think, by using very clever metaphors, and while he's describing all these quite dark and negative things, he has a very, very laid back flow, and the production is was really laid back as well. It's just, oh, it's just such a perfect combination. Just, just listen to it, okay? Just listen to Happy Wasteland Day, and all will be good. Second of all, how could anybody feel at home? The, the production on this song is very, very atmospheric, and Mike's delivery continues to build up until he reaches a climax and approaches the hook. He just paints a very interesting picture of the Robert Taylor Holmes with this track and certain experiences within the Robert Taylor Holmes. Third of all, we have My Auntie's Building, which is the closing track. Now, um, this track, this, this track dropped my jaw when I first heard it. Because of how low-key the album had been up to this point, I thought that, judging by the title, this was going to be quite a mellow closer, uh, and it would be about, like, the one place that he could find comfort and solace amongst all this fear that he was feeling, which was in his auntie's home or his auntie's building. I thought that was going to be the one place where he could feel safe. But no, turns out when I reached this song, uh, I realise it's actually about how the Robert Taylor Holmes got demolished and knocked down, and how he vividly remembers his auntie's building getting knocked down in particular. Uh, the production on this song matches the subject matter as it just kind of sounds like distorted noises and destruction. The album just ends with these crazy blaring sounds that just insinuate that the Robert Taylor Holmes are being destroyed. Uh, also, amongst all this noise, Mike is saying, that's the sound of them tearing my body down to the ground, which infers that he feels like he is part of the projects where he grew up, and the blowing up of the projects are like blowing up a part of him. On it, it just left me shook. It left me completely shook. And it feels like he's telling us all these intricate, deep and personal stories throughout the whole album. And then all of a sudden, it just ends on this immediate down note. And there's no proper resolution. I actually quite like this though. I quite like this decision to just end the album on this dark note. It's not something that usually happens. You usually have a resolving sort of song at the end of most concept albums. Not this time though. Not this time. It ends with darkness. Flower Boy. Tyler the Creator's always been a bit of a troll, uh, and a lot of people say his prior albums like Cherry Bomb, Wolf, and Goblin are just kind of immature, and they just they lack any true emotional substance. Well, with Flower Boy, Tyler has started new. Flower Boy contains a lot of quite beautiful, soulful production, and what's most impressive is that every track was produced by Tyler himself. He explores a lot of personal themes like sexuality, love, friendship and his dealing with fame. There also seems to be this recurring theme of Tyler's like personal journey um, and there's also this recurring sort of thing about cars in the throughout the album and the car is like the metaphor for him and as he's driving these cars he's getting closer to his destination, getting closer to discovering himself which on the last track Enjoy Right Now Today you hear a car door open at the end of the song as if Tyler's reached his destination and he's kind of now, finally, after all these years, found who he is. Anyway, uh, some of my favourite songs from this album. Uh, number one, the intro track, Forward. Tyler opens the album with some absolutely ridiculous metaphors and wordplay. Especially the part in the second verse where he's talking about how many riots can it be until those black lives matter. And then the line about a life's a game of basketball. Oh, just... Just, I'll put them on the screen for you, but you need, to, you need to listen to this song. The Rex Orange County feature is also a really nice addition too. He has a, he's, he just very well suits the track. Secondly, I Ain't Got Time. I love how on the track before this, Boredom, which Rex Orange County is also featured on, uh, Rex sings on the hook, find some time to do something, and then the next track, this one, opens with Tyler saying, I Ain't Got Time. Most of the songs before this one on the album are quite calm, 
quite deep quite personal, quite reflective, and then this one just comes out of nowhere with this incredible energy, and Tyler's really braggadocious, really confident, just dismissing people that pretend to care about him because of his fame. Uh, it's all this fake friend business. A lot of rappers talk about this, but this time, it was just very hard-hitting. The beat changes midway through the song to this, like, sick halftime beat, and you know I love my halftime beats, so this made me pretty happy. Well, you probably don't know I love my halftime beats, but I love my halftime beats. For those of you who don't know what a halftime beat is, you're probably sitting there thinking, what are you on about? Anyway, third, we've got Garland Shed. On this song, it appears that Tyler's really showcasing his vulnerability. He openly discusses sexuality and his attempt to find out who he really is. This is also where Tyler most explicitly alludes towards the fact that he's at least thought about the fact he might be gay, although he never explicitly actually states it anywhere that he is gay. Estelle is featured on this track and her vocals fit perfectly with the production. I really like the decision for Tyler to just rap everything he has to say towards the end of the track because it kind of symbolises that he's hesitant to be open about all these deep and personal things but he finally just gives in and shares everything that's on his mind. And let me tell you, his flow is absolutely ridiculous because of the amount of things he has to say in such a short space of time. And the one line I can pick out that I like the best is when he says, Stepping on that ladder, trying to grab the rings of Saturn, I'm a planet by the time you hear this. Just a fantastic track from a fantastic overall album. Damn. Most of you who know me personally probably would have guessed that this album would be at number one because of how often I talk about and praise Kendrick. Anyway, I have a lot to say about this album, so uh, this is going to be quite a long one. I guess this is just the album I've researched the most out of the six. Damn is Kendrick's most accessible album, and by accessible, I mean that it appeals to a wider group of people than his previous two LPs do. Good Kid Mad City appealed to quite a lot of people, but I think Damn does it even better. I think what makes this album so good to me is that Kendrick has come out with some more mainstream tracks, which, you know, I don't love the idea of, but in doing so, he has not sacrificed or compromised his lyrical talent or his ability to tell stories. For example, the song DNA was an extremely successful track in terms of plays and streams. However, Kendrick still delivers a fantastic lyrical performance. Songs like Humble, Loyalty and Love were also three of the biggest hip-hop songs of 2017, especially Humble. Kendrick even admitted himself that he wanted to make radio hits on Damn. He wanted to have a few songs that would really elevate his popularity. However, these, these songs that are more mainstream and more radio-friendly still make sense within the thematic context of the album. After Good Kid Mad City and To Pimp a Butterfly, I think a lot of people viewed Kendrick as a saviour and somebody who wasn't in need of guidance or prayer and he didn't need any help. Kendrick addresses this directly with the recurring line, Ain't nobody praying for me. On the song Triple X, Kendrick gets a call from one of his friends who seeks guidance from Kendrick because his son's just been killed. But Kendrick replies to him saying that he would try to get revenge if he was in the same situation and his son had just been killed. Showing that he isn't this pure being that a lot of people thought he was. At the end of this phone call, Kendrick says, Matter of fact, I'm about to speak at this convention, call you back. And then the next verse he references gun control as he's speaking at a convention, showing his hypocrisy in murdering somebody and then preaching gun control the next minute. Kendrick shows that he is in fact not a god, and is actually human. My three favourites from this album, uh, number one, Yar. Kendrick speaks of his connection to God on the hook, apparently, uh, where he says radars is buzzing, Yar Yar, Yar Yar, with Yar being a reference to Yahweh, a Hebrew name for God. Reduction is very nice, and I actually love how Kendrick sings on this track. I much prefer it to his singing on Loyalty and Love. A lot of people have pointed out that this song sounds like something Drake might sing on, uh, which I think is kind of accurate, actually. I don't really know why I love this song so much. I just kind of do. Secondly, Pride. The production on this song is very ethereal, uh, and I love the Anna Wise and the Steve Lacey features. They're perfectly placed. Kendrick really seems to be acknowledging his flaws on this track, and he lists off a load of ways that he would act if he and the world were both perfect. I love the callback to the song These Walls from To Pimp a Butterfly, when he says, I know these walls, they can listen, I wish they could talk back. Very, very detailed and atmospheric track overall. Finally, 
Duckworth. This track closes the album and is probably one of Kendrick's best lyrical efforts to date. He tells a story of how his dad was very close to being killed by the current chief executive of Kendrick's record label, uh, Anthony Top Dog Tiffith. Kendrick's dad, Kenny Duckworth, worked at KFC, where Tiffith and his gang robbed and shot a customer one time. Kenny figured he would become friendly with Tiffith to avoid having the same fate, and he gave Anthony free chicken every time Anthony went to KFC. This decision from Kenny changed both of their lives, and Kendrick and Anthony went on to thrive later on. Because as Kendrick puts it, if Anthony killed Ducky, Top Dog could be serving life while I grow up without a father and die in a gunfight. In the middle of Kendrick saying the word gunfight, he is interrupted by the sound of a gunshot, signifying what could have been his death had his father been killed by Anthony. Parts of the album then play in reverse until we hear Kendrick's final words on the album, which are also Kendrick's first words on the album, so I was taking a walk the other day, making the album a full 360. While, in my opinion, Damn is not in the masterpiece category that I placed Pippa Butterfly in, it's still a versatile and fantastic effort from Kendrick Lamar. And I'm eagerly anticipating his next release. What is it going to be? No one knows. My camera just turned itself off. I don't know what that was. I mean, you didn't notice it because obviously I've edited it out. The part where it just turns off. But uh, anyway, um, what was I doing? Oh, the album. Wallflower. Jordan Rakai's Wallflower narrowly gets the top spot for me, even though the top three albums are pretty much all tied for number one. This also happens to be the only non-hip-hop album on the list. This album dropped in September, I believe, and I heard the first three singles which were released prior to the album, which were Sorceress, Nerve, and Goodbyes. Rakai announced that the album was to be called Wallflower, which I just didn't know the meaning of. And it turns out to be somebody who is like regularly out in public, but actively avoids engaging with people. Uh, with this LP, Rakai just delivers 11 tracks of beautiful soul music. Although there was one track which I didn't really like, which was Clues Blues. But the rest of them, amazing. The songs are just very colourful, very personal. And here are my three favourites. First of all, you've got the album opener, Eye to Eye. I was pleasantly surprised with how good of an opening track this was. It starts off with like this really simple guitar. And then Rakai just begins to set the scene for the themes of the album. And then about two minutes in, the instrumental just bursts into this really colourful sounding vibe. The song ends with this really long, really cool drum instrumental, which I think I really liked because I play a little bit of the drums myself. Uh, some of you, if you listen to the song, I don't know if you'd like it to the same extent. But I loved it. For some reason, this is my favourite song on the album. It just is. It's just good. Secondly, you've got Nerve, which was one of the singles released prior to the album. Rakai's lyrics on this track are actually quite abstract, as they are throughout the whole album. But the hook, especially on this song, really does stick with me, where he says, How can I find a reason to love you when I don't love myself? It reminds you that you have to have self-worth and self-importance before you can truly bring yourself to love other people. Third of all, you've got the song Hiding Place, where Rakai paints a picture of running away from his situation out of fear, and he just wants to be alone in a dark place. I kind of interpret the instrumental as being constructed in a way to sound like somebody's running. It's just very well executed. I'm gonna be honest, I haven't actually looked into this album as much as I have with Damn, but it was just such a pleasant surprise for me when this album came out. Whereas with Damn, I was already anticipating an album from Kendrick for a few months. As you know, he dropped that promotional single, The Heart Part 4, where he indicated that he had an album coming out in April. With Wallflower, I didn't even realize that Rakai had an album coming out until about a week before it was released. I really liked his debut album, Cloak, uh, and I just didn't know what he was gonna do on Wallflower, so it was a very pleasant surprise when this album came out. I haven't really exposed myself to it as much or analyzed it to the point where it just kinda loses its meaning like I've done with Kendrick's album. Or maybe it's just because Kendrick's album is a bit more popular than Rakai's, uh, and I'm just inherently a hipster. That brings me to the end of the list. Uh, here are some albums that I acknowledge the fact that they exist but they didn't get on the album for one reason or another. So first of all, I didn't mention any of Brockhampton's Saturation Trilogy, because I haven't actually listened to the albums in their full yet. I've heard a few of Brockhampton's songs, and I quite like them. I just haven't listened to the albums enough, or at all, to be, to be mentioning them in my favourite albums of 2017 list. I'm going to have a listen to them soon, and maybe then I'll let you know if I like Brockhampton 
that much. There are other critically acclaimed albums that I haven't listened to, such as Mount Erie's A Crow Looked At Me, Lord's Melodrama, Jay-Z's 444, Vince Staples' Big Fish Theory, Sampha's Process, Stormzy's Gang Signs in Prayer, and the list goes on. And for any of you Drake fans wondering where more life is, technically Drake doesn't brand this as an album as such, he calls it a playlist, when it, it really is just an album. It's an album, it's just... I don't think he's put that much effort into the album. So he can get away with calling it a playlist so people don't critique it as harshly as they would if he branded it as an album. More Life definitely wasn't a bad project. I felt it was a pretty good project. It's just I didn't really like many of the songs. And as a whole, I just generally didn't like More Life that much. Although it did produce three of my favourite songs of the year, which were Free Smoke, Nothing's Into Somethings, and Do Not Disturb. Anyway, in the long run, lists... They're just not even that important. I love every album that was on this list, and I hope to find more great music in 2018. What were your favourite albums of the year? Let me know in the comments, if there are any, and I'll probably speak to you guys in about 12 months when I next upload a video. And that's it. That's the video over. You can leave now. You can stop watching this on your phone, or your computer, or your tablet, or whatever you're watching this on. You can just exit the video now there's nothing more to see or hear apart from me talking quietly and a little bit seductively into my camera okay no just yeah the video's over bye